Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for my free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Michelle Leader. Michelle, are you ready to join the mission? I'm ready to join. Sign me up. <laughs> well, uh, I, like, I like your intro. It's one of the shortest intros that I get. Most people have very long intros. It's so hard to write a short one. And so therefore, I want to, first of all, appreciate that. And let me introduce you to the audience. Michelle has probably read more SEC filings than just about anyone else on the planet since writing her book, Financial Fine Print, Uncovering a Company's True Value and starting her website, footnoted nearly 20 years ago. <laughs> Michelle, take a moment and tell us about the unique value that you bring to this wonderful world. So, you know, what I do is I look at the footnotes in, in SEC filings. It's really as simple and as complicated as that. Um, you know, there's all sorts of companies are required, publicly traded companies I'm talking about, companies that you buy on the stock market are required to disclose all sorts of information, but they're not required to, um, you know, tell you about what they're disclosing, right? They disclose it and if they put it in, six point font in you know on page you know 59 b and then give you a footnote and exhibit um you know that's they're disclosing it right you can think back you know when i first got really into this you can think back to enron and enron basically you know not as detailed as we've later learned but they basically pointed a pretty broad stroke brush on what they were doing um, you know, all the way back in 1999 before the company, you know, they, it was right there in their 10K that they were involved in these crazy, they didn't call it crazy related transactions, but they basically disclosed this and, and it was there for the taking, but nobody really, you know, paid much attention to it. I wouldn't say nobody, but very few people paid attention to it. Mm. <clears throat> and you so and I have... it's basically, it's basically finding surfacing information that companies are disclosing to the public, but that few people are paying attention to. And I'm excited for, for the listeners also to, we're gonna have a discussion after your story to talk about kind of the lessons that you've learned. But <clears throat> let me ask you, who who is it that that could benefit from what you're doing? And you know, in some ways you're doing an obscure kind of thing to some people they may think, uh, but there's, people that are benefiting from that, whether that's from your book, your blog, or other services that you provide. Tell us about the type of people that benefit from what you do. Well, I think if you own an individual stock, you you know can potentially benefit from this, right? You know, it's, if you're doing an index fund, probably not. If all of your investing is straight indexing, mutual funds, you probably don't have to bother with reading individual SEC filings. But if you own an individual stock, you know, and if it's more than, let's say, you know, throw away money to you, then, you know, this is something that could be helpful to you. And whether you use me to help you do it, or whether you just dive in on your own and go to Edgar and, you know, dive into the 10K, that's okay too. You know, if I can share some tips with you on how to go about, you know, reading SEC filings, that's, you know, part of the mission, so to speak. Mm. And tell us, remind us where, where's the best place to start? Is it getting your book or is it going to your website? And what should we expect there? You know, the book is now almost 20 years old. So it is, you know, a little bit dated. I'm going to be honest about that. Um, I think that, you know, where do you start on the tips? Um, you know, I just did a webinar, um, you know, an online webinar uh, last week that talked about how to read a 10K. That might be a good place to start. Um, you know, uh, I'm happy to provide you a link with that for yep. your show notes. Yep. Um, you know, we can, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of, you know, starting, you know, starting places. It's really just, you know, but I think what I also would stress is that this is not, 
you know, one of the challenges, I guess, that I come across is people are like, I just want to know what stock to buy and when to sell it. I am not your girl for that, your mm -hmm. woman, your person, whatever. That is not me. I'm not going to pretend to be that person because that's not what I do. What I'm showing you is why it's important to understand what's really going on at the company and how this can be, you know, um, either save you from losing a significant amount of money or, you know, to um, benefit from something that few people are paying close attention to. You know, the fact that it's disclosed doesn't mean that everyone else is reading it. It just means that it's disclosed. Mm. Yeah. And when you think about the lawyers involved in things these days, they just want to get everything kind of dumped out there. And if you can dump stuff out in a general sense, like the the risk, the list of risks for, for, for people that I teach, like in my valuation masterclass, when they first look at a company's financial filings, they're like, oh, my God, there's so many risks here. What they don't yes. realize is that the lawyers are dumping out all of this and in a general sense to try to basically say all that is ultimately, I believe, is probably cover your ass. So they can say, well, it was in there. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you know, if you want to get a real look at that, look at Walmart, you know, they haven't filed their 10K yet because their calendar year is a little bit different, you know, their January 31st instead of December 31st. But like, you know, they will disclose pretty much every lawsuit that Walmart has ever received. Now, you can imagine a lot of those lawsuits are like slip and falls, right? Um, or, you know, things like that, um, you know, shoplifting arrests or, mm. you know, whatever, you know, like very minor, minor things that are unlikely to bring down Walmart. But buried in there could be some more significant cases. You know, you look at, you know, last week, I, you know, I do this free newsletter on LinkedIn, for example, that looks at the footnote of the week. Mm. And, you know, last week I was looking at Johnson and Johnson. If you look at, you know, they're, they're, of course, you know, a big company, they got in, you know, really, um, you know, um, the, the talc lawsuits have really, you know, taken a hit for them because they've, you know, brought back some significant um, damage awards. You know, if you go back to their 10K, what was very interesting, if you go back to their 10K two years ago from, you know, 2020, they don't mention the word bank, you know, they don't, they barely mention the word bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is not a word you want to see in an SEC filing in general, but they barely mention it, like, and it's kind of in passing. And then last year, they mentioned it like something like, you know, 40 times. And then this year, when they filed their 10K, it was like 90 times because they've tried to spin off this separate company to basically absorb the talc lawsuits. So there's all sorts of, you know, I mean, I, I guess that's what I would say is like, there are all sorts of tricks that the lawyers who are preparing these filings are involved in. And there's nobody on the investor side who's trying to help investors understand what these tricks are. I'd like to think that I'm that, that person. Investor advocate. Um, I want to tell you a story that this reminds me of. I was in Hong Kong for a CFA conference and uh, a very eminent guy got up and spoke about the AI type of thing that they had been in, in uh, creating that, that, that surveyed uh, the language coming out of companies. This was a while ago, actually, and tried to predict bankruptcy. And mm -hmm. so they went through this automated system and, and everybody was pretty impressed. I think he was from Reuters or Thompson Reuters or wherever, but, and, and then I asked, I had a couple of questions, like how much have you spent on this? You know, and they're like mm -hmm. millions to develop this. And I said, so my, my last question is how much better does this predict bankruptcy than a simple Altman Z score that was developed 40 years ago mm. that that anybody can simply calculate and already gives us a pretty good warning. And he looked at me and he said, by just a small margin. Wow. And I thought that was interesting. And maybe it's improved, but I would say sometimes the old traditional tools like an individual like yourself reading is quite effective compared to using all kinds of AI. And I'm just curious, how, how do you see what's going on in the world of, you know, scanning and trying to get the language out of, out of things versus you as a person reading and interpreting what's going on? You know, I, I certainly look at a lot of the AI things and I, I you know, there's a number of services that um, I like to think of myself as Switzerland in that sense. There's a couple of different services that are going down the AI route and they give me access to their service so that I can look at it and kind of like, I wouldn't say beta test might be a little bit 
too ambitious of a word, but that I can see what they're doing, for example. Mm. And I think that, you know, there's just a lot of interesting things, but ultimately I think the problem that I've noticed at least is that a lot of the AI attempts are approached as a coding problem. Can we code this to predict something? But they're not coming at it from the subject expertise. Like the coding is only as good as someone who understands. It's like, it, it, it's you have two separate problems. Can I code this to find red flags? Yeah, you can code it to find red flags. Do I know what red flags to specifically look for? I might know some of them, but I don't know every possible red flag. Who could have predicted the tout lawsuits at Johnson and Johnson that that might bring a comp? I mean, Johnson Johnson's like Dow thirty, right? I mean, or it was. You know, would you have predicted five years ago that this would have brought that this could potentially bring them down? Mm. If you did, you're you know much smarter than I am. Um, you know, I mean, yeah. it, it's you don't know what you don't. You know, this is the problem, right? You don't know what you don't know. Right? There could be a lawsuit that's making its way through the courts right now that can bring down Apple. Who knows? I have no idea. Um, you know, it, it's it's that type of thing. And so it's trying to like predict for the unknown. It's very easy to predict when you know when you know what you're trying to predict, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can do the score and you can say, will they file for bankruptcy? And you can get a yes or a no or you know, relative whatever. But you know. Um, you know, could this particular event lead to bankruptcy? Well, if you don't know what the event is, you know, you're kind of lost. Yeah. Um, it made me think that, you know, the the key, <clears throat> um, actually, what I like to call what you do is also AI, but I call it actual mm -hmm. intelligence. <laughs> and uh, some people say artificial versus, uh, you know, actual or whatever. But the point that I would say is that I would guess that you're kind of a master of progressive nuance. Yeah. Like trying I mean, to understand where that yeah. language is changing just slightly because you still have to predict it before it happens or else you're not adding any value, I would assume. Yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes it's just a very, you know, slight, I mean, it's, it's, it's a singular turning into a law, uh, you know, a plural. Is it subpoena or now it's subpoenas? I mean, that's, you know, a pretty simple thing, right? Mm. Um, you know, it's it's all these little subtleties that you can pick up. Am I going to find every single one of them? Absolutely not. Yep. Did I predict Johnson and Johnson on the talc thing? No, absolutely not. If I wasn't, you know, it was not on my radar a couple of years ago. I remember like when I first heard about it, and I thought, oh, this is kind of you know interesting, whatever. But it was disclosed like every other lawsuit. You know, mm -hmm. the, like we can't estimate it. You know, working its way through the courts. We're fighting it vigorously, you know. I mean, there's language that the lawyers who disclose this stuff use over and over and over again, and it's it's you know very dull language, right? They're trying. Remember, you're up against people who are trying to make something sound as innocuous and dull as possible, right? They're not writing at this like, oh, this lawsuit happened and it could potentially blow up the company in two years, so pay attention to this, you know. They're not putting it in bolding. They're not putting, you know, they're not making it in larger font. Um, you know, they're they're doing that's their job is to make it sound as innocuous, boring, routine as possible. It's a great, great point that they're trying to distract you or uh, I, I kind of picture two young men uh, attracted to the same woman. And the one guy's talking to his friend, oh, she's not that good. And it's not that, you know, and the whole purpose of what he's trying to do is throw the guy off the trail so that he can have the girl to himself so um i mean one of the things i think about is i grew up in new york in the 80s right and there used to be you know before they cleaned up new york um you know largely cleaned up you know new york right. there used to be these guys who would stand on you know different street corners i don't know if you've been you know if you're familiar with this andrew but they would play three card monte right and so three card monte was basically like a cardboard table and they had three cards and you had to like guess where the coin was underneath the cards and they do like you know do this and do that and like you know it was a total setup it was a total scam there was a guy who would like pretend to win big and they would reel in someone you know thinking they could win like a hundred bucks on the street corner by following the card type of thing um but you know it's basically like what this is what companies are doing they're like pay attention to this Pay attention to this metric that I'm touting. Don't pay attention to that metric. 
that mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm, you know, or they're changing the metrics, like, or they're changing what's in the metrics. One year EBITDA includes this and one year it includes the next quarter it includes that. And are you really paying attention to that? Are you able to pay attention to that given, you know, if you own even a couple of stocks, if you own five stocks, for example, are you able to successfully track revenue recognition in all five quarter to quarter to quarter? Mm. Now multiply that if it was like 20 stocks, yep. you know, um, that sort of thing. So it's really just being open to the idea that, I guess it's being open to the idea that that companies are doing their best to divert your attention and trying to get you to pay attention to what they want you to pay attention to and not what they don't want you to pay attention to. Yep. So I think um, I'm going to call it your origin story. I think it's time to uh, think about uh, that. So now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, I was a relatively new investor, right? I had been, um, this is about 20 years ago, and, um, you know, relatively new to investing. I had been, you know, a, a journalist for about 10 years at that point, um, a business journalist, but I bought some shares of Quest Communications because I was covering IBM at the time, and IBM had just announced the big deal with Quest. And, you know, I thought like this would be a great opportunity to buy some Quest shares. I, I don't, I couldn't buy IBM because I was writing about IBM. So I think I just decided I was going to buy Quest. And, um, you know, I watched the shares go up and up and up and until they stopped going up. And then I went back and I looked at the 10, you know, I looked at the filings, the 10K and the 10Q. And this is actually like an appendix in, at the back of my book, even though it, you know, it's an older book by now, but it's an appendix at the back and it basically talks about what I learned by going through those filings. It was like a postmortem, you know, it, you know, basically hmm. like, and I went back and I looked at the footnotes and I was like, oh, okay, you know, basically IBM, like they booked all of, you know, I forget what the amount of the deal was, let's just say it's a billion dollar deal. So they booked that entire billion dollars up front in year one, even though it was like a 10 year deal. And it was a 10 year deal with like a gradual, like, you know, so it wasn't like, you know, things like that, like catching stupid, you know, like, like catching stupid stuff like that. And I think about it now and I'm like, how did I, you know, not catch, I didn't know to look at it. I was like, oh, they have this billion dollar deal with IBM, you know, and then like booking all the revenue year one sounds great. You know, and, and, and so that's, you know, I wound up watching Quest go all the way down. I think I, I, I don't remember what, I, I think I bought it around like nine or something, watched it go up into the fifties and like finally got out of it when it was like maybe 12, mm. um, you know, or so. So, you know, uh, didn't lose, lose money, but, you know, certainly could have made a hell of a lot more on it. And I would say that that was one of my worst investments, but it also led me to this career basically, which was it prompted me to write the book. It prompted me to start footnoted based on my personal experience with Quest. And, um, you know, it, it, in some ways it was, you know, a learning experience, a, you know, a learning experience that continues today, mm -hmm. almost 20 years later. I mean, the book came out and the website started in um, 2003. So it's, you know, in August of 2003. So, you know, in a couple of months, it will be 20 years old. Wow. So maybe it would be great to kind of take that 20 years of knowledge and say for the audiences, we're focused on trying to figure out how to reduce risk. And let's say for those in the audience who are buying individual stocks and are thinking about that, maybe you could just summarize the lessons, some of the lessons that you've learned in that 20 years, you know, in addition, obviously, to the lessons that you learned from that story. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, look, today was a 10K deadline here in the United States for large accelerated filers, um, you know, companies that are on, for companies that are on a calendar year and companies that are larger companies, they had to get their 10K in today, um, you know, and you saw like a bunch of 10Ks being filed today. I mean, I was just looking, you know, Steve Madden came in today 
and you know the equitable companies came in today and you know it's just like a large number of companies were basically getting their filings in today if those are stocks that you own you know so you have fresh 10ks right now this is a great time of year and the 10k of course i don't know i hope to not be so you know too basic with your listeners but the 10k is sort of the big document right it's the annual report but it's not the annual report that has the glossy cover i like to say it's not the annual report where the custodian shaking hands with the CEO to show how diverse the company is. Um, this is the actual annual report with the numbers and the footnotes and all of that. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, it's a real, um, you know, it's a great jumping off point. It's a great time of year to dive in. You have a fresh 10K, start there, you know, and um, look at the risk factors. Look what the company is saying about the way that it thinks about risk. You know, one of the things I was looking at JP Morgan Chase's, you know, um, uh, recent 10K. And last year, their very first risk factor was, you know, COVID, basically COVID. It could be, you know, a big, huge risk, blah, blah, blah. Well, this year, it wasn't not only their first risk factor, it was barely mentioned at all. Now, this is like, that not only tells you a lot about JP Morgan Chase, and what they're thinking, but you know, given their role in the economy and how large and significant they are, you know, it tells you a lot about sort of the general economic climate and sort of, you know, I mean, Jamie Dimon appears on the world stage all the time on the Davos, you know, the the one in the desert, you know, um, you know, it, it, you know, he's a major leader, and so mm -hmm. like when you can read, you know, you have a fresh 10K from last week dive in start looking at it look at what they're saying about risk factors that's a that's a great point you know if you're looking for trying to understand if you just pick out a couple of top leaders who are responsible for these and look at the risk factors uh that's you know such a great uh, point and how how let's say when we talk about risk factors as i was saying like the the legal side of things they just want to dump 15 different risk factors out there mm -hmm. to try to be able to say we covered our ass. But I'm just curious, like when you read these risk factors, how are you trying to interpret this or how should the reader interpret this kind of overwhelm of negative information? Well, I think it depends. Are you an investor in that company? You know, you've got to go and you've got to look at, you know, you can't read it in a vacuum. Yep. You've got to see what they said most recently, the last the last 10K. Um, there are services, you know, that do that, um, that black line the filings for you. There's probably a dozen or so different services that you can pay for. If you don't want to pay for the service to black line it, you can go into Microsoft Word and do a lot of cutting and pasting. Um, it, you know, it will be time consuming, but it will, it can be done. Hmm. Um, and it's cheaper than, you know, paying for a service. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, different services out there that process that synthesize the actual SEC filings hmm. and kind of, you know, dig in there and they will tell you what is new. You know, there's a service by, um, AlphaSense, for example, um, that does this. There's a service by, um, uh, a company called In Filings that's now owned by Verity. Um, there's Sentio, which is now owned by AlphaSense. Um, you know, so there's a number of different services out there. Um, a newer one called Bedrock AI that looks at, um, you know, that also does this as well. Um, and, you know, of course, Bloomberg, I think, does it. And there's a service, you know, uh, Blackline. I don't know which one it is, but any number, let's say there's like a dozen different places that you can go to get this information. I, I mean to be agnostic here because um, it really doesn't, it almost doesn't matter which one you were to choose. If you happen to um, have a subscription to one, it's not that another one is going to be a thousand and seven times better. Um, you know, so, um, you know, it's really important to look at this not in a nutshell, you know, like to basically understand here's what they said last year here's what they're saying this year mm. and how do i you know and i would really quite frankly i would only do this if it's a significant position for you nice. if you own 100 shares in this company and you know you're not counting on it to pay for your mortgage or your retirement or your kids education or fill in the blank um you know you can probably you know skip it i mean there's certainly companies that 
I own 100 shares in that I'm not reading every single word of the filing. And if I'm not reading it, you got my permission <laughs> that you don't have to read it either. Right. You know, but they're not companies that I'm counting on for sort of like the significant events in my life. I'm not counting on that investment to put my kid through college. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of I started in the Thai stock market in 1993 and financial statements and annual reports were very First of all, they weren't that easy to get. Yeah. And second thing is that they weren't, they didn't disclose much more than the numbers. There wasn't a lot to them after the, and I remember <clears throat> that Bangkok Bank, I was a bank analyst and Bangkok Bank had done a bond issuance and they'd done an international one. So there was a prospectus out there. There were prospectuses out there, but the we couldn't find it. And eventually I found it. And when I read through all the risks and stuff like that, I was like, wow. I mean, this is like just having this document was like a mm -hmm. treasure trove of information for a sell side analyst. Nowadays, of course, all that stuff is available. And for the banks after the 97 crisis in Thailand, they the level of disclosure became so big. I just uh, I used to have foreign investors come to Thailand and they complained about disclosure. I'm like, look, if if you're complaining about disclosure, you're you you're mistaken because basically you couldn't even read the 150 pages of footnotes that they produce now, you know, giving mm -hmm. you this information. Yeah. Um, so it's it's just it's interesting how much information is being revealed. And I wonder maybe you could now let's move on from the risk section, which you really just sparked some thoughts in my mind about honing in on the top respected companies and people that I like in different sectors that maybe I should spend some more time looking at the risks that they're talking about, like Jamie Dimon as an example. Uh, now let, let's move on to the rest of the footnotes. If we go beyond uh, the risk factors, then we go into you know things related to revenue recognition, like you've mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. Also, things related to inventory and how they're accounting for that, or you know, losses on accounts receivable, or you know, how they're booking fixed assets or whatever. Maybe you could give us a, a one or two little tidbits about what you've learned from going through that part of the footnotes. You know, it's funny. Actually, one of my earliest examples, again, when I was first starting out, it was like if you go back and you look at eight. Remember AOL. You know, some people still have an AOL account. I just emailed someone who had an AOL account today. And you always think like, really? Like they still have an AOL account. Okay. America online. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, anyway, you know, um, if you think back to when AOL was, you know, was a publicly traded company, um, you know, it, if you go back and you look at some of those earlier filings and you can see, you talk about revenue recognition and that is important because it's not, it's not, the company is telling you the revenue in the numbers, right? They're saying we made, you know, we took in X number of dollars in revenue, but then you need to understand how did they count that revenue? And is it different the way they counted it this time than next time? I mean, think back to the Quest example. They booked a billion dollar contract that was like a 10 year deal in, you know, all up, all up front in the first year. Yep. Now they had to disclose that. So, I mean, like, that's the type of thing I think you know, you see, you know, thinking of the AOL example, and this is where I was going with this. If you go back and you look at some of AOL's earlier, I'm talking about like, you know, long time ago, right? All of a sudden their revenue recognition went from like one or two paragraphs to like six or seven paragraphs to like two and a half pages on revenue recognition. Now you don't have to understand every single word in that two and a half, you know, page disclosure to understand that things have gotten awfully complicated if they're going from two paragraphs to two and a half pages in a, in, in a little over two years, in basically a two year period, mm. right? So things like simple tricks like that, I think can really, you know, help you, even if you're not, you know, willing, you know, to do, you know, sort of the heavy lifting and really dive in. Um, but I think it's important, again, if this is a significant position for you, it's important to understand this. If it's a hundred share position, um, you know, you on, only you know how risk averse that you are, right? Like if losing that amount of money on whatever you own is gonna be, you know, problematic to you, um, then you should be reading this stuff. Yep. Um, so I think, you know, like revenue recognition, you know, you look at inventory disclosures. I mean, you kind of hit on two of them there. Mm. Um, I always like to look at, you know, I, I, you know, one of the things you get to look at in the 10K 
is not only employee headcount, you know, you're seeing a lot of news about a lot of layoffs lately. Very in, 10K is the only time of year that you actually get bona fide information on the employee headcount. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting little, you know, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to make a difference mm. one way or another, whether you buy the stock or whatever, but it's in, in your analysis, it's important to know. They mm. also disclose the buildings that they own, like, you know, their, their properties, it lists that, like, what are they renting? What are they owning? You know, how does, how has that shifted at all? You know, there's all sorts of little tidbits in there, you know, that you can really um, use as any number of jumping off points, depending on what your level of interest is. And would you say that any particular industry is particularly good or particularly bad? Like, I don't know, real estate versus infotech versus financials or something. What has been your experience there? Well, I mean, I think like, you know, certainly, you know, I mean, the SPAC space has been <laughs> kind of <laughs> interesting to, uh, you know, pay attention to because it seems like their rules are um, a little bit different than mm -hmm. than other rules, um, you know, and, and certainly that's been interesting over the past couple of years. I think that, you know, you find, um, you know, the tech space where, you know, for a while, like, for example, you know, when Yahoo was a publicly traded company, um, you know, a standalone publicly traded company, you know, there was a big disconnect between the numbers they were reporting, um, you know, to the, you know, like in their, you know, for earnings, basically, and revenue. And then if you actually went back and looked into the 10K, there seemed to be a significant, you know, because of gap and the way they explain gap income and, um, you know, all of that, I think that was kind of an interesting thing. So, you know, certainly the tech sector, you know, I think the tech sector more than others is very good at making up their own metrics. Like they'll talk about, you know, it's gone beyond EBITDA to like, you know, um, EBITDA minus this, minus that. And the way I like to think about that is when companies, you know, and, and certainly Warren Buffett has coined the term best. He's like EBITDA is bullshit. You know, I don't know if he actually used the word bullshit, but like he basically, that's basically his, his you know, thinking on it. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, if you think about it, it's like, you know, you have, think about it from your own personal budget, right? Like I have, you know, my own personal budget. I have, a, you know, I have X number of dollars coming in each month and X number of dollars going out. But if I didn't have to pay for, let's say, my car payment or my mortgage or marketing expense for whatever, you know, buying some lipstick for to appear on a podcast. Mm. Um, <laughs> I'm just using that as a silly example. But um, anyway, you know, if these are things that like companies will exclude, they'll exclude their marketing expense, they'll exclude their legal expenses. It's like almost like there's no bounds on what they feel that they can exclude as an extraordinary expense, right? Mm. Um, you know, a legal settlement, uh, or whatever. And so you really need to be paying attention to this stuff if this is a significant, you know, position for you. Mm. Yeah, it's. Uh, um, I I must admit you've gotten me kind of excited, and I uh, I I used to spend a lot of time reading the notes to financials and. Uh, in my valuation masterclass, we've just started to really introduce that. And I think I want to do more with that. And so uh, I, I'm thinking about it. And so the last question I would have is, uh, are there, is there any, I've, I've asked you about sectors, but now I want to ask you just, is there any particular leader of a company that you think, like I'm thinking of Jamie Dimon as an example, but uh, where, or a company that you just think that's a valuable, you know, that's a valuable document, you know, whether that's, you know, trying to understand risk factors that are going on. Uh, you know, it is the time that they sit down and try to explain what's going on in their business, but they also, we can take clues about what's happening in the overall economy or what are the risk factors. Is there anyone that you would say, read the, the risk section of this particular uh, company as a starting point? Well, I think, you know, JP Morgan Chase is a great starting point. Their tentacles are in a lot of different parts of the economy, um, you know, and, you know, they're pretty much a straight shooter, um, you know, in terms of that. And I think that, you know, I mean, you know, Berkshire Hathaway is a great other 10K. I mean, that's very straightforward, written in a very straightforward way um, and kind of a, well, that's more his letter, his chairman's letter is a folksy letter. But I mean, I think, you know, if you look at some of these big companies, 
you know, um, I would look at, you know, how, what their approach is, um, you know, to it, because they spend a lot of time and thought on it. Um, you know, but just, you know, I, I mentioned the 10 Ks only because there's a lot of 10 Ks right now. And today happened to be a deadline day. But, you know, there's other filings that you should be paying attention to. I mean, really, there's like, you know, at the bare minimum, if you own an individual stock, you have three 10 Qs, uh, the 10 K and the proxy statement. You know, so now that the 10K deadline is 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 over with for the most part, you're going to start to see the proxy statements. I think proxy statements are really important because, um, you know, one, you know, I, I, I joked around that they're the sexiest document in the SEC. I don't know what that says, I mean, but it's uh, maybe sexy and SEC should not be two words that go together. But I mean, it is, you know, the only document where it really provides detailed disclosure on compensation. You know, I was just looking at, for example, and this wasn't in the proxy statement yet, but it was an 8K. And so 8Ks are the other filings, and those are sort of the in-between filings that happen, you know, when a company discloses something. So, you know, I mean, uh, they just disclosed, for example, if you look at Meta, um, that they, you know, they, they've been spending $10 million a year to provide personal security. They give basically um, Zuckerberg, um, $10 million a year for to spend on personal security, mm -hmm. um, you know, for him. And they just increased that by 40% to $14 million. Now that was in an 8k. If I own meta, I would be interested in that information because I'm like, huh? Okay. So, you know, they make a big deal. I mean, this is again, that shell game, right? right. They make a big deal about he only gets a dollar in salary. But he's getting $14 million is to cover like, you know, I don't know, former Mossad agents and whoever else, you know, so I think, you know, it's again, it's like pay attention, you know, the company's trying to tell you pay attention to this, not this, you know, I don't I didn't see anything about this 14, you know, increasing it, and certainly not about increasing it by, you know, 40%. There was another filing that I saw a couple of weeks ago, Bright Horizons, they're a major provider of daycare centers here in the United States. Now daycare, you might have seen the news recently. Daycare is a major issue in the United States. I can tell you, being you know a parent, um, you know when I had to provide daycare for my child, it's a huge expense. It could be upwards of three thousand dollars a month um, to get anything close to quality care, um, which is a lot of money for a lot of people, right? Especially after tax dollars. And so there was a filing from this you know CEO, and they were increasing the guy's salary by twenty seven percent. And they were giving him like a hefty, you know, um, stock award. And I look at this and I'm thinking like, huh, maybe they could be paying the daycare workers a little bit more or, you know, perhaps using the money. I mean, is, is, is it going to be materially different to the CEO's life that they're increasing his salary by 27 percent? You know, that that's a significant increase. Right. Right. You know, no, I wouldn't have cared about it if it was like, you know, whatever the, the inflation, let's say even if it was seven but 27 percent mm. that seems like an excessive increase giving mark zuckerberg an extra 40 percent in security costs you know um those sorts of things i think like there's all sorts of things you can find in the filings if you really just dig in and ultimately you're creating a mosaic and i guess your skill is being able to understand when a piece of information obviously as a standalone basis a piece of information has some value but when you start mm -hmm. to put that piece of information with a, an evolving picture, I'm guessing that's when you really come to the the conclusions that are super valuable. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, I would say that no one disclosure is like, you know, I think it's very rare. I, I can maybe think of like, you know, two or three examples where a company like, you know, like, like there was a disclosure and it was like, oh my God, get out of the stock right now, roof's on fire. It's almost all a mosaic. Like you see this, you know, maybe it's like the, like think back, you know, this was like about two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, it was, uh, it was uh, Peloton. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden there, the audit committee chair resigned out of the blue that day. Okay, and the stock was trading at that time at about $125, $130 a share. And you're thinking like, huh, directors don't. Now, would I get out of a stock just because the audit committee chair resigned that day? Mm, probably not. Mm. Um, you know, I would probably like look at, you know, I would probably consider that a red flag, but I wouldn't necessarily 
um, you know, think about it as being like a reason to get out of the stock or short the stock. But then there were like a couple of other similar types of disclosures and you started to realize like, you know, like the CF, the CEO changed his 10 B five plan. And like, there were just a couple of different things that went on. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, you know, uh, what you had is you had this sort of like drip, drip, drip. And that's when, you know, so yes, it's rarely one thing that will be like sort of the, you know, pants on fire, get out of this stock type of thing. Okay, I'm going to ask you one last question of this uh -huh. discussion before we wrap up. And that question is, uh, for my for, for young people around the world, this is the type of students I teach valuation to, um, and they don't even realize like the amount of work that needs to be done in the notes of the financials and stuff like that. What would be your advice for budding financial analysts who really want to become great in the way they analyze and and we're talking about beyond, you know, doing an Excel spreadsheets or something like that. This is about really understanding the importance of those notes and that. What advice would you give them? I think just start with one company, one or two companies that you know well. I mean, you know, every company has a slightly different way of disclosing things. Every company, you know, there are like, let's say, six to eight different law firms that tend to like specialize in writing this stuff. And so a lot of the language is recycled, you know, it's not virgin language, mm. um, you know, but I think start with one company, pick a company that you think you know well, um, you know, maybe you know their story well, maybe you're a big user of their products, maybe it's Apple, maybe it's, you know, Meta, maybe mm. it's, you know, whatever, something that you use on a regular basis and see what can you find out from by reading, you know, start with like some of the basic filings start with the 10k the 310 q's the proxy statement what can you find by understanding by digging into those filings um that you didn't know before um and does it make a difference you know i mean you can pick up on styles you can see is the company more open or is it more you know like closed i mean you know these are all things that you can pick up they're subtle signals and i guess i would say like you know reading filings is very much this is where ai comes in you know, reading filings is still very much an art as opposed to a science. Mm. Um, it really takes an understanding of what it's it's not just like what is the company trying, you know, it's it's basically the company is saying this, but what are they really trying to tell me? So it's almost like reading, like intuiting the meaning behind what they're trying to disclose. Um, and and that, you know, takes experience, quite frankly. It takes, you know, I've been doing this. I like to say I've been doing this, you know, just about 20 years and there's still things I learn about, you know, things that surprise me about filings every day. Progressive nuance. Yes. Um, that's great advice. And I, I have to admit, you know, I, you really inspired me and I've been thinking about, you know, for this podcast, we're all about reducing risk. And I've been yep. thinking about, you know, also in my upcoming uh, next boot camp that I really need to spend more time talking to them about reading. And I, reading these filings. And one of the things that I would say is that it's not a common thing. And whenever you find that most people aren't doing it, you find that there's an opportunity to differentiate. There's an opportunity to gain. And so I think yes. you have opened up the window of that opportunity for myself and my listeners. And as a result, also for my students, because I'm going to talk more about this particular interview and our discussion. So I appreciate that very much. My last question for you. Yeah. What is your number one goal for the next 12 months? Wow. I think, you know, um, if I'm being honest, it's, it's, I had to, I recently came back from a long hiatus. Um, my mom, my mom was very sick for a number of years and I had to put my site on hold for uh, about four years. It was basically on hold for 2018 to 20. I really only just started back up in November of 2022. Mm. And so, um, you know, that was a personal choice. I feel incredibly fortunate that I was able to take that time and spend with my mom when she was sick and she needed me. Um, but now that she's passed away, um, I think that I'd like to try to, you know, focus a lot more on my business again. Yeah. Uh, well, it's great that you had the opportunity to spend that time. Um, I <clears throat> brought my mother to Thailand six years ago when my father passed away and she's my number one listener. So mm. I'm, I'm, 
And um, hi, mom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I remember uh, a friend of mine uh, uh, who basically I he had taken care of his mom in, in Thailand. And I, I, I asked him uh, his name's Robert. I asked him uh, when I was in the U.S. with my mom and, and my dad had just passed away. And I asked him, you know, what what's your thoughts or your advice about bringing my mom there? He said, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. It's going to, you know, change your life but it's something that you will never regret. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I appreciate, you know, what you've shared and the time that we can spend. And I would say in my case, six, almost seven years now that my mom and I have spent from her when she was 78 till now, <clears throat> you know, 84, uh, 85, getting to 85. <clears throat> it's like, I can't even really remember my mom and my relationship before that because it's so much deeper and different now from spending that time together. And I just, he, he just said, you know, you're never going to regret it. And I don't regret a minute of it. So hats off to you for doing that. And also uh, having the opportunity to that, do that because not everybody has that opportunity. So, um, yes. <clears throat> well, thanks. <clears throat> yep. Listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. If you've not yet joined that mission, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com and join my free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter to reduce risk in your life. As we conclude, Michelle, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment do you have any parting words for the audience? Thanks for having me on, Andrew. I think that, um, you know, life is a learning experience and uh, I'm glad that you get this time to spend with your mom. That yeah. sounds, uh, you know, in the end, it's not about, you know, the money. It's about the quality of your relationships. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, take care of your mom. I'll see you on the upside. <laughs>